My name's Eric Gundacker. Uh, I got a farm. We have farms in Rosemont, Minnesota, and Reedstown, Wisconsin. Our primary farm is in Reedstown. Um, and we solely 100% operate out of high tunnels. And just for my information, how many of you have high tunnels? Or houses? Okay, and then the second question is uh, how many of you are very far? Um, basically, our operation is, is, uh, let's see here, okay, um, we're, uh, we have 15 high tunnels in between Rosemount and Reed Sound, 13 in Reed Sound, 2 in Rosemount, and we grow very, uh, very vegetable crops, uh, certified organic tomatoes and peppers, primarily tomatoes, 60% of our crops in the tunnels are tomatoes, tomatoes being red slicers, romas, uh, heirloom cherries, and heirlooms. Um, we also have cucumbers, we grow a few herbs, uh, a new crop that we uh, did this year was ginger, if you're aware of ginger, it's a tropical plant grown in Hawaii. Um, and it basically, to get to mature ginger, you need a nine-month growing season, which you don't have in the upper Midwest. But through our solar high tunnels, we can get that nine-month growing season. So we had a successful ginger crop. We planted in two of our solar tunnels, and this year uh, we're going to plant an entire high tunnel in ginger. Uh, you can harvest ginger in less than nine months. You can harvest it in four or five months. It's what they call green ginger, and it's basically smaller size ginger. Whereas our our ginger that we harvested in, in nine months, it was larger than what they were harvesting out of Hawaii ginger. And we basically attribute to our soil is better in Minnesota and Wisconsin than the volcanic soil in, in Hawaii. So, and if we can give it the climate that Hawaii has, then we can grow good ginger. So, um. My background is engineering, uh, computer engineering. I got into uh, farming specifically and put our first high, uh, high tunnel up seven years ago in Reedstown. Uh, we do also have, in the berries, we have blackberries and strawberries. So we have three high tunnels and blackberries. And presently we have four high tunnels that are wintering June strawberries. And then we also have, and those will be harvested in May. Uh, we'll grow straw on them in March and start harvesting in May, basically a month before the June berries come. Um, and then we'll harvest them through the middle of June. And then we have a, you'll see later on with some of our slides, we have a system we're developing to vertically grow day neutral strawberries so that you can have strawberries from May. Uh, I want to first talk about um, this critter here. Now, I'm going to kind of date myself here, but when I was a kid watching TV back in the 50s and 60s, the, one of the first horror movies that came out was a movie of these big, and this just scared the blood off me, these big bugs that, that attacked this town, and the movie was called Them. <laughs> well, guess what? They're back. <laughs> back in the form of the Sapa. Obviously, they're not this big. They're more like, if you see that dot in the left-hand corner? They're more that size. I mean, you barely can see them. I, with my aged eyes, can kind of make out them flying around. They're brown. Our field manager can actually see the uh, uh, male fruit, uh, they're fruit flies, by the way. The male the Sapa has spots on its wings. The female has a like a receptacle uh, on it uh, that it deposits the eggs. Um, the problem with Drosophilus are they attack ripe fruit. They don't go after overripe fruit, they go after ripe fruit. So, and, and their gestation period is a period between cycles, between laying the eggs and, and, um, and larvae is like seven days. So, once they get in into your crop, 
and there's thousands of them, uh, they mollify very fast, very hard to control, almost impossible to control. First time we had them was four years ago. We didn't know what they were, and by the time the season ended, we ended it soon because we couldn't keep up with uh, the life cycle of the with all the spraying we did. So as a result, we said, well, there's got to be ways to control this. So we decided to um, uh, basically put a net, an insect net, around the high tunnels. Uh, and the way that we attach, uh, I'll get to the, uh, let's see, okay, the netting we get from an outfit up in Canada, uh, I got the website there, it cost uh, $304 or uh, six and a half by 328. And what that'll do is do an entire high tunnel. So what we do is we net the sides of the high tunnel. We put netting on the sides. We put netting on an end wall. Entire end wall is a four foot side walls on the tunnel. Most of our tunnels now are new tunnels that have six foot side walls. So all we're doing with those is putting the netting on the, on the uh, side walls and then uh, one like a hayloft door on one of the in walls. And the reason that we're putting it on the in walls is that uh, the netting restricts the airflow in the high tunnel by up to 20%. You'll notice inside the high tunnel, it'll be less windy inside with that netting. Um, the other important factor thing that we do is we set traps. Uh, these traps are plastic cups with holes in them. You can go online and type in uh, spotted wing to soft the traps and they'll show you how to make them but they basically have cedar cider vinegar in it uh, that attracts the, uh, the, the fruit fly and we're monitoring those traps uh, both inside the high tunnel and outside the high tunnel. Outside when the drosophila first shows up is usually around the middle of July. Thus we don't have problems with the soft on our early strawberries they're done by the middle of June, uh, but for our, our day neutral strawberries and our blackberries, which come in July and August, we definitely have problems with the cassava. Um, what these traps do is allow us to uh, see when they first show up. So, uh, and even with the netting, we found that the cassava will get inside the high tunnel, not always, but it will get in, but the important, the key feature is, it does get in typically through the door it will uh, be in such a small number that you can do something about it uh, whereas if you had it totally wide open in the sofa it would be a lost cause <clears throat> and I know I've heard of many of a berry grower that have stopped growing berries because of the sofa um, also we have bumblebees in our high tunnels uh, as pollinators and before we uh, if we have to spray inside the high tunnel if we get a few desalva in there we have to spray we always close the bumblebee hive before we spray but that you don't have to physically remove the hive you can just close it up you spray that night and then the next day you open back the hive up and all our uh, berry tunnels our strawberry tunnels blackberry tunnels we do have uh, beehives in all of them uh, how much do the beehives help? Uh, we don't know, but we know that they're doing good in there. So that's uh, the question was, do you use bumblebees versus honeybees? Uh, I guess we use both uh, in our berry tunnels. Where we, and The reason I say both is there's an Amish guy down the street that has a honeybee, uh, several honeybee hives, and we know those honeybees come up and pollinate some of our other vegetables, but they can't get inside the high tunnel with the netting on it. So our primary source of pollination in our berry tunnels are the bumblebees. And they do one hive, one class C hive, in a 30 by 96 high tunnel is plenty. And we get our bumblebees from Colbert, K-O-P-E-R-T, they're out of Michigan. They cause fog. Oh, about 130 bucks chipped in, and we use one hive per year. And typically, the hives last four to six weeks, but we find out that the bees will live longer. And as soon as our, our 
our uh, blackberries are done, uh, we move that hive to uh, one of our other tunnels, tomato tunnels, or whatever, and it helps there too. So. Um, <clears throat> installing the netting on the high tunnel, we've learned that basically you have your plastic that's attached on the sidewall of the high tunnel. It's attached with, uh, Farm Tech calls it a uh, U-channel, uh, like Potty Tech calls it a uh, a wiggle wire base. Well, anyway, the plastic's attached to the top of the sidewall using that wiggle wire. What we do is we pull two or three strands of the wiggle wire off, but not the whole wall. And then we start attaching the netting behind the plastic. And then we reattach the plastic back up. So we work ourselves down the sidewall, attach, unattaching, attaching the wiggle wire as we put up the netting. So we can, when we're done, we have them netting up, we have the plastic attached, reattached, and then the bottom of the sidewalls, the way we're attaching the netting to the bottom sidewalls is wood lath, you know, run wood lath across the bottom. Um, you need, these things all, and we don't know this for a fact, but we assume the spotted wing will go get into a hole, so if you get any holes in your netting, the sidewall you have to attach, you have to that hole and we use when we're still investigating different kinds of tapes that'll that'll work without matching those holes. Okay, um so how effective is it? We occasionally get spotted wings of sapla in the high tunnel, but like I say they're in, in the tunnels in such a small number. We can go in there with a treatment of pyganic or intrust and in two weeks we can take them out of it, get them out of the high tunnel. So, but what you got to do is you can't, and, 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 and what triggers us to go in there and, and, and spray is the, the spotted wings are in the traps. So we're monitoring the traps once a week to see if there are spotted wings. If there are spotted wings inside the high tunnel, then we begin the spraying. And, but in some of our high tunnels, we haven't had spotted wings. So, you know, basically they're probably getting in through door and we've looked at different ways to try to seal that door by doing a double netting type thing but it, it, it really doesn't seem to help me. They're, they're going to get in there, they're going to get in there. Um, we did try, if you look at that picture on the left, that was a, a bed of strawberries we had outside. We put hoops over the top of that uh, bed and then we put netting over it and and obviously, before we that, the sapla was in there. And we sprayed through that netting. In a couple of weeks, we eliminated the sapla in there. But the problem is to pick the berries, you got to take the netting off, and that'll have a chance of letting the sapla back in there. Uh, another uh, a method to control there's a grower down in Illinois that a large strawberry grower down there, but he tried, um, and again, his strawberries are done before the sapla shows up, but he tried blackberries. And to control blackberries on his tunnel, he used uh, a three-day rotation of Intrust and Pyganic, um, which Omri approved, organic proof that Mustang Max is not Omri approved. He's not organic, but he was using Pyganic Intrust anyway. And he seemed to say through that method and culling, which means picking up all the, all the ripe berries off the ground, any ripe berries at all, he was able to control uh, the spotted wing. But the, it lays the eggs inside the, this is kind of gruesome now, lays the eggs inside the berry and the eggs hatch out into little white larvae, uh, maggots. <laughs> so anyway, and you can see them, you cut open the berry, you can see the white maggots inside of it. The berry gets mushy, so if you, in the July time frame, if you're buying any berries at the farmer's market, if they're mushy, they probably are infested with the sophila. Every, every farm has got it. it. I mean, in one year it went from one farm to all the farms got it. I mean, it was just, and every state's got it. I mean, East Coast, West Coast, well, it started on the West Coast, East Coast, and then the Midwest, but in five years it's just throughout the country. We also use 
offset netting for our cucumber high tunnels because we have a problem with a cucumber beetle in our high tunnels. It gets in there and again, if it starts you know, going through its life cycle, it's hard to control it using sprays. So what we do is, before we plant the cucumbers, we put the netting, this same esophagus netting, up on our high tunnels, which keeps the cucumber beetles out, which shades a lot of spray. It's a lot of time. Uh, also, we've seen the sophila around cold tomatoes, uh, piles of cold tomatoes and sophilas lying around. Uh, we haven't seen them in a tunnel uh, with uh, uh, regular tomatoes. Uh, the thick skin of tomato, it seems to have a hard time penetrating that. Uh, but in a coal pile where you've got broken tomatoes and stuff, it, it's in there. Again, I think the lesson learned here is you, uh, high tunnels is not a 100% fail safe method to stop the sofa, but if you monitor it with traps and if you see them in the tunnel with traps, get in there and spray right away and in a week or two you can eliminate the sofa. I want to talk about some other stuff, some research and development. I'm just going to go through these briefly. We've got a, a SBI, USBA SBIR grant to do uh, solar, solar thermal development and uh, environmental controllers. We're automating these high tunnels, so we, uh, you know, rolling up the sidewalls. You got to roll these things up by hand. Well, we have motors run by thermostats, run by a controller that roll up the sidewalls. We have a <coughs> controller that will. Uh, do irrigation inside the high tunnel, manage the irrigation, the circulation, the exhaust fans. We're trying to automate these high tunnels. The less hands-on we have, uh, the, uh, the more time we save, plus it gives us some oversight on what's going on in the high tunnels with these controllers. Uh, and if we have uh, extreme conditions like it, it, it goes, it approaches freezing. Right. <laughs> You're out of luck. I tunnels go to freezing while our controllers monitor the temperature. Well, let us know via an email if we have a, a low temperature or a high temperature. So we adapted these controllers, this called environmental management system, to drive our solar thermal. And basically, in this particular high tunnel, we've got two furnaces. we got one furnace that heats the air inside the high tunnel that generates the heat from the solar panels. That's furnace, <coughs> furnace number one. Furnace two is taking air up to the upper top of the high tunnel, storing it in, uh, uh, running it through a, 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 a coil and a, a storage tank. And then we take that water in the storage tank and pipe it through a uh, underground water system we have below the plants that heats up the plants. You increase the temperature in, that's called zonal heating. You increase the temperature in that, uh, in the root zone, you can increase the production by up to 50%. And we're testing that out right now. We actually have a high tunnel that we're, this particular high tunnel, using it against a control to see how much improvement we get in, in crop production through zonal heating. So what we're trying to do is heat the high tunnel inside, heat the soil inside, uh, to basically give us that nine-month growing season. With a nine-month growing season, we can get two crops. We can get a, tomato, a strawberry crop harvested in June, plowed under, planted tomato, planted cucumber crop. Uh, so we can get two crops. We can get one long season crop like ginger, or like our indeterminate tomatoes we planted in the middle of March. And we had tomatoes. We sold tomatoes to the co-ops for Christmas dinner this year. So we had, to, and this is the longest we ever usually be trying to make it till Thanksgiving, but this year we made it till. Christmas, so our indeterminate tomatoes lasted from March to Christmas time. So we had tomatoes for nine months. Well, <clears throat> we're getting 20 pounds of plant off those tomatoes, so we're really increasing the length of the growing season with these solar thermal high tunnels. And but they do cost. But there's uh, uh, incentives out there to help pay for it. So let's say the the tunnel, the solar thermal tunnel with the controller costs 45,000. Uh, you can get the high tunnel through an NRCS equipped grant up to $10,000 free. So 
Tung Hai tells me. Okay, the, uh, there's a, a, a Fed tax credit called uh, investment tax credit solar for solar and wind. It's a 30% tax credit, so you can get a 30% tax credit. If you live in, in um, Minnesota, they have a 25% grant for solar. So in the end, that $45,000 high town is now, the final cost is 15000 Well, if you increase your yields by twice, three times, if you can grow crops you couldn't grow before, guess what? It pays for itself in two or three years. And those numbers we have in here, those are actual numbers that we got out of the you know, like uh, uh, growing garlic in the high tunnel, 6K, growing uh, uh, the strawberries we plant uh, in September and harvest in May and June, 6K. And then we follow with a tomato crop that we can get 10 to 15K off the tomato. Well, in a couple of years, that pays for this $15,000 high tunnel. One other thing we're doing research and development is vertical growing in high tunnels. Uh, high tunnel square foot is premium price. I mean, you're trying to get the most out of that square foot, so why not go up? So what we've done is uh, we're in this year, it's the fourth year of a research project where we're looking at ways to grow day neutral strawberries in high tunnels using uh, vertical the stacked pots. We started out with tubes, those blue things on the top, tubes, and we stuck the tomatoes and or, uh, strawberries in each one of those tubes, and it didn't work very well. Uh, and it just didn't grow. And we found out, well, you need two quarts of strawberry, two quarts of substrate for every strawberry plant, which those tubes didn't give us. So we went into pots. Well, the pots weren't big enough. So we finally ended up developing up our own pots, uh, eight-sided pots. They hold about 25 quarts of, of substrate. We have our own substrate that we've used. We tried different combinations, found one that really works with horse compost, and purple cow, and vermiculite, and perlite, and speck and moss. Um, and right now, we're at a point is <coughs> we're, our goal is a half pound of strawberries per plant to make this thing economically feasible to do this. Because uh, let alone the pot for a, for an higher entire, entire tunnel is going to cost you probably 15000 So to make this thing economically feasible, we need a half pound of strawberries per plant. Well, from July 23rd to through the fall until into November, we had strawberries. We got a 0.21 pound per plant. Now we're going to be starting them now in in February, uh, get them in the pot by March 1st, so we'll have a spring crop. We think that spring crop will give us that half pound per plant. Um, and then our ultimate goal is a pound per plant, because by doing it a pound per plant, we can reduce the price of the strawberries to half what we're getting. We're getting four and a quarter a pound of strawberries, organic grown strawberries. If we can reduce the price to two dollars a pound, then we can sell them eventually. And then that opens up the whole we're still growing it organically. We're selling it to conventional, and there's a huge market out there for strawberries. We figured we could grow 20 high tunnels of 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 uh, vertical grown strawberries to supply uh, and organic, just to supply the Twin Cities in Chicago. If we could uh, uh, go after the conventional market. That 50 times that. So it's a huge market that we can go after. And you can see where it's not too bad. Whoops. That tunnel, or that slide on the little right hand side is, I think it was taken about in August sometime. Strawberries are, were, you know, I say every year we go through, we find something else that we can improve this. And then the last thing that we are going to work on, we haven't started working on it yet, um, is vermicompost. Uh, we use about 10 to 15 yards per high tunnel of horse compost. Well, guess what? <laughs> We're running out of horse compost. I mean, the guy that gets us the horse compost, he, keeps, he gets them a stable or two stable.
stables a year. He has to continue to go out further and further from our farm to get this horse compost. We're running out of horse compost. We use a lot of horse compost for these high tunnels. A lot of organic matter. We're sitting at 10 to 20 percent organic matter in our our tunnels. Uh, so we're using a lot of compost. We're running out of it. So we're looking at supplementing it using develop a system using worms to, to generate compost that that we can use in our high tunnels. This guy out of Michigan State, John Birnbaum, that runs a Michigan State University organic farm, he has actually developed a process out of using high tunnels. He gets his raw uh, material from uh, MSU's um, uh, cafeteria and he converts that via hot composting in a high tunnel. He's developed an actual composting that he's creating vermicompost through the use of high tunnels. And what we want to do is duplicate that process and, and put together a system that could be that every farm could incorporate their own method of developing vermicompost. So no matter what the uh, requirement you have for ver for compost, you know, you can adjust your system according to that size. And that's something where each one of these three topics I talked to has resulted or will result in an SBIR proposal. Uh, and they're typically uh, phase one, phase two, they're a half million dollar grant. So that's what we're going to apply, probably write a proposal this year for this Burmy Commons. I know I went through this stuff kind of quick here, so any questions on it there? Okay, the question was would you get some heat from the compost? Uh, yeah, I, we've no, we've looked at different ways of heating high tunnels through compost. We've found farms that put like a pile in each corner of the high tunnel, and through the composting it generates heat. But you know we're requiring quite a bit of heat to heat in November, so that might work. Uh, maybe extend the season a couple of weeks at the beginning of the end. But something we need much more heat. To give you an example, this year we used about seven thousand uh, dollars at a dollar. Per gallon of the LP, LPs at a dollar a gallon. Last year was a buck eighty-five per time. So we used seven thousand dollars worth of LP to heat seven high tunnels. So we're using about a thousand gallons of LP a year to heat, and we're heating most of our LPs used in the fall. In the spring, we probably use a third of the LP that we normally would use in the fall. We start heating in September and heat this year until Christmas time. So, but yeah, there's. Other ways to generate heat inside these high tunnels. Okay, are there limitations in getting the NRCS grant to uh, relative to what you're doing with the high tunnels? Is uh, only in ground allowed? And the question is, yes, in ground growing. But there, there's there's <laughs> again when the NRCS equip grant came out, no electricity was allowed. No heating was allowed. Okay, that's changed. So, okay, the the, the systems that are uh, vertical systems you're, we're using right now are in ground. We just have to put them in troughs. That's in ground. <laughs> you know, it's in ground. It's in troughs. We're trying to confine the heat to the troughs, but we are using dirt. We're emphatic on using dirt. We don't use hydroponic. It's the bricks level of dirt grown fruit is, and vegetables are twice what. So as a result, the vegetables and fruit taste much better. So, yes. I don't. Okay, what changes have they made to the heating regulations on the Eclipse Tunnel? I'm unaware of any change. I, other than initially they didn't allow electricity in the high tunnels and you need the electricity to run your torpedo heaters now uh, that's allowed so you can heat your high tunnels as far as I know I mean, I, uh, I'm not the only grower that's heating their high tunnels there's many growers in Minnesota that are heating their high tunnels yes The 
EMS controller, environmental management controller, allows us to log temperature data and, and archive it. Uh, we also log when the pumps come on, when the pumps go off. So we have a lot of data on the performance of the high tunnels using that EMS. Yeah, we, we monitor each comes in, you know, these numbers that we quoted you and these dollar amounts that we're getting from the high tunnel. We we track our uh, data through our accounting program, QuickBooks. We track the yields that we get out of per high tunnel. Yeah. Okay. The way our pickers run is they, they start picking in one ton, uh, high tunnel. Okay, so let's say they're picking in, in high tunnel two, they're picking tomatoes. They bring it back to the sorting table. At that time, we log that, how much we picked at the, at the sorting table. So that's how we keep track of it. Yes? Okay, uh, one of the methods to solar heat the high tunnel is pull air from the top of the high tunnel. Yes, we are pulling air from the top. Now, that's not as efficient as pulling air from solar collectors. The top of the high tunnel, if best case, if you had it closed and growing nothing in it, you can get 120 degree heat in March in those high tunnels. Well, growing stuff, you're not going to get that. So your top of the high tunnel typically is 80 to 90 degrees. So you're pulling that 80 to 90 degree heat running through a heat exchanger in a tank and warming up the water in the tank. Well, the water in the tank can only get to 80 to 90. Whereas our solar collectors, uh, we, turn, uh, we turn the pumps off from them when they hit 280, just for a safety reason. We turn the pumps, to, okay, so they drive water or propylene glycol through a water tank uh, that has got a heat exchanger. That tank, we turn the pumps to the collectors off and that tank gets 150 degrees. So the water coming out of the solar collectors are by far warmer than the water coming from the top of the high tunnel. Uh, so what we're doing now is this year we're taking some of the water out of the tank from the solar panels, which is a lot hotter, and we're using that to run it to help heat up the, the, the uh, soil temperature. So that's one of the advantages of this, you try something, well, this will work better, so we're moving the pump from the, the tank that gets the uh, heat from the top of the tunnel to the tank that gets the heat from the solar collectors. We're moving that pump that pumps the water through the ground uh, to, to try to warm up the ground faster. We don't have any data on that because we just did that this winter, so this spring we'll have some data on that. Now, okay, we've been told by the manufacturer of the tubing that we put in the ground that we can get a 50% increase in our yields by heating the saw. So tell me, okay, where do you get this stuff? Okay, well, we get customers that call us in and they say they're... So this year we're going to actually, we've got a tunnel that we're going to, a control tunnel with no heating in it and a tunnel with solar so we can pair the two to see exactly how much increase in yields we get off that heat. The, we, bought, we built uh, two by eight troughs, 18 inches wide. So the uh, tubing is on the bottom of those two by eight troughs. And then we put dirt on top of that, compost on top of that. And then our, this year, one of our tunnels is going to be ginger, totally ginger, because we can get a nine month growing season. Uh, another one will have the control one that we're compared against the non control one. Those two will have uh, indeterminate tomatoes. So we found the trough system uh, by taking two by eights and making a trough out. It kind of keeps the heat inside versus just using a raised bed. But we haven't tried the raised bed and putting the tubes in the raised bed to see what kind of performance we probably will. <laughs> it's a pioneer. Yes? Do you warm the irrigation water? Uh, no. We, uh, our irrigation, it's an irrigation slash fertigation system. We run the water through a, a, a injector system through a 55-gallon pump, a 55-gallon tank, 
we can fill that tank with uh, uh, fish emulsion to fertigate our plants. But th that's the only warming that we get is in that tank. It goes into the tank before it goes out into the fish. Uh, well, you could if you pre-warmed it, if you threw it in a tank and got it, you know, settled, you know. But, you know, <laughs> here's the problem that we're using, uh, we're irrigating usually twice a day for an hour to two hours. We probably use uh, a thousand gallons a week for a high tunnel. So to have a storage facility, unless it was a pond, to store that to preheat the water would not be practical. You know. So uh, does it, would it help to preheat the water? Sure. Is the ginger grown in the ground or in pots? It's grown in the ground. It's grown in the ground. Just like it's grown in Hawaii or Peru. It's grown in the ground. So You can grow it in pots. So I know people bring it inside during the winter and, and grow ginger inside. But, you know, like we planted, to give you an idea, we planted about 40 pounds of ginger and we had about uh, 350 pounds of ginger as a result of that. And we're hoping to get a little bit better ger uh, germination this year to make more like from seed to seed to harvest a 10 to 15 times ratio from the size of the root, the rhizome, to the actual. <laughs> we got some fantastic pictures of ginger root. We got two pound ginger root from the single. Whereas, you know, we got pictures of a hot Hawaiian and they're twice the size. Ours are twice the Yes. What's our market for ginger? Are we selling direct? Or are we retailing? We're selling at wholesale. Wholesale market for ginger from Peru is about three dollars a pound. We're getting thirteen dollars a pound because we're locally grown ginger. Okay, are we getting that just from our co-op? No, we're. Is there any control for flea beetles in high tunnels? Uh, what kind of crop are you growing? Okay. Are they, I, I don't know if beetles sell, are they bigger or smaller than an aphid or a white fly? Pretty small. Well, anyway, this netting, uh, the netting comes in different, they call it grains, and we get the smallest mesh to stop that little and I'm sure it stops aphids, it stops white flies, so probably would stop that. So you could use this. Again, if you put the netting before you plant, keep the, there are going to be some in the soil, you know, that'll come out, but it, it, that netting will prevent any from coming in during the season. And it will, it will stop it. It will stop the bugs. And like I say, we're using it for our cucumbers now, so. And, we'll, and eventually, because of our rotation with strawberries and stuff, we'll probably have it on all our tunnels here in five or six years. Uh, two by eight. Uh, the question was, what did we build? Uh, it wasn't here that we ran through. We built troughs uh, to plant two, uh, six troughs in the high tunnel. They were built out of two by eight, 18 inches wide, two by eight. And we filled it with dirt. We filled it uh, with compost, but at the bottom of the trough is it's one half piping that we get from Delta T. Uh, they supply a lot of piping for bedding plants and some also some in-ground plants like what we have. Uh, and that, but, but we're putting water through those pipes. You know, the air system that we've got, the solar air system, is where we're either taking air from the top of the high tunnel or we heating up air through panels. We're taking that air via fans and pumping it 3,200 foot of four inch drain tile buried three foot down in the soil to heat up that soil. In fact, that uh, we the first solar system we we put in was that we took the air from inside the high tunnel and ran it through the, and this is 40 years ago, we ran it, give you some data on how, we ran it through the ground, 32 feet of four inch drain tile in the ground, we ran that heated air. It raised that temperature, soil temperature, three to seven degrees. 
our controllers, we monitor and we have data, temperature day loggers in the ground, we monitor that temperature. What does that mean? We had, this year we had uh, peppers, green peppers in that high tunnel, June, marketable green peppers, June 10th, because it was, the soil was heated to 70 degrees in March. Four-inch drain, yeah, uh, that corrugated drain tile. Yeah, uh, Four-inch, you know, like 3,200 foot. So we ran it the length of the house. Okay, the lifespan of the netting. The longer we have the the netting, the uh, more holes it gets in it. <laughs> so, I mean, the first year we had it, and my wife had her dog in the high tunnel. The dog wanted to outside the high tunnel. <laughs> and a little netting doesn't stop a dog. So, it... it put some holes in it, we were able to kind of semi patch it with tape, like high tunnel tape. It's got to be a very adhesive tape, duct tape, things like that won't work. Uh, we contacted 3M and they're looking into uh, some type of tape that'll repair those holes, but we've had it on our tunnels now for four years, and all we've had is holes from critters, or dogs, or uh, occasionally a rabbit, if he's really hungry, will go through that netting. Um, but for the most part, the netting is really durable. What you got to watch is when you put it on, don't stretch it really a lot. It'll stretch some, but you'll find, well, I can stretch it a little bit more, a little bit more. But what happens is you make the, the mesh bigger, you know, the holes in the mesh bigger, so that the software can fly in. So you want to kind of limit how much you're stretching. 